Welcome, this is Richard Stanford. Uh, today's review, we're going to do The Big Goodbye, Chinatown and the Last Years of Hollywood uh, by Sam Wasson. Um, there's been a real trend in recent years of making uh, books about the making of a particular movie. Uh, Don Graham did the making of Giant. Sam Wasson did the making of, uh, of uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, there have been books on, on, the, on the set and the making of uh, The Wild Bunch and of High Noon. Uh, it's real popular and it's real great for movie files to read these because after you re read them and you see the picture, it just means that much more to you. Uh, the title on this, The Last Years of Hollywood, what does that mean? Because Hollywood certainly uh, hasn't had the last years. We're talking about... Uh, uh, a, a movie industry that's that's gone on f since this was made for another 55 years or so. But um, what he's really talking about is his theory that, that this movie represented the last of the old Hollywood kind of movie that, because uh, uh, pretty soon we were making Jaws and all kinds of Star Wars epics and a lot of stuff with special effects and so uh, the, the kind of mood movie, the, the old, big, costumed, uh, photographed Hollywood movie, um, he sees this as kind of the last of that sort of movie. Everything happens at Paramount Studios, uh, and it's really the story of four people, really. There are a lot of people in this, some very interesting people, but the four we're talking about are Robert Town, who was a screenwriter. Uh, who was a friend of Jack Nicholson's, who is, of course, was then and is now a very famous actor. Uh, Robert Evans, who was the new uh, head of Paramount Studios. This was going to be a Paramount film. Uh, and Roman Polanski, who was uh, called in as the director. It's really a story of those four people. The three friends is what made it happen initially. Uh, basically, Robert Town was a good friend of... Jack Nicholson's, they were all friends of Robert Evans. And so these friends could throw, throw ideas around and come up with something. Roman Polanski was not part of that, but he ends up being the most important element of the whole movie because it becomes his vision in so many ways. Um, Town, uh, Town had grown up in Los Angeles, Robert Town, the screenwriter. He, uh, there was something about old Hollywood that he loved he wanted to do some story that was set in the old Hollywood of the 30s. Uh, he wasn't quite sure what it was. He always loved uh, Raymond Chandler novels, you know, The Big Sleep and, you know, the, the, the detective Philip Marlowe and all that. He loved that sort of thing and was trying to figure out how to set something in old Hollywood. And, of course, there's going to be a detective involved, so he involves his very good friend Jack Nicholson, who was the perfect detective. Uh, Jack was kind of at the height of his powers. He had done, he had done Easy Rider, and, and, and this one just took his career off. Uh, after this movie, he won a, uh, later a, a, an Academy Award Best Actor for uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, Robert Evans um, was also in love with the old Hollywood way of making movies. He had been discovered as an actor by Norma Shearer, and, and had been some as an actor, but kind of a pretty boy. And, but he decided he really liked uh, producing. And so he became a producer. And by the time we start this, he is the head of Paramount Studios. He lives in a home called Woodland. Now, Woodland is the epitome of the old 1940 Hollywood home. Uh, it, just, it just reeks of, of old-style movies. And that's what he really appreciated. Uh, now, Roman Polanski, um, you know the name for various reasons, and we'll talk about his life after this movie, but Roman Polanski was a Polish. Um, he, he had lived in Paris. They moved to, uh, po back to Poland uh, during the war, and, of course, he'd been part of the uh, Krakow experience, and then they'd moved to Warsaw. He was part of the Warsaw Ghetto. His mother was taken away and died in the concentration camp. Uh, he as a young child basically ran to safety. Uh, so he had a tough childhood. Uh, interestingly also, he was, uh, he was and is one of the great movie technicians. Uh, he knows every aspect of it from editing and sound and, and uh, 
uh, it, it's all it's all uh, known to him. As a director, he knows the whole process and uh, cinematography and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, we'll get back to all those people. Right now, what I want to talk about is uh, how this all started. Well, it started, as I said, because Robert Town wanted to make a movie about old Hollywood. But what's it going to be about? You know, what's going to be the story? And uh, keep in mind, this was the Watergate era, and there was a lot of disillusionment uh, about amorality and, and confusion about what was going on. And so there, there's kind of that underlying tone. A town wants to make a movie about old Hollywood, but it's it's going to have some amoral elements and it's going to have some confusing elements and who's the good guy and who's the bad guy and some really kind of sophisticated stuff. Um, now he knows it. Well, he knows he wants to make it about water, and you say, "Well, water? What? What in the world?" Um, he had done some research. He and his wife had done some research about the land and water frauds that took place back at the turn of the 20th century when uh, L.A. kind of corrupt politics caused them to, to, to take certain land moves and do certain other things uh, that diverted the water from the Owens Valley in California for use in, in L.A. And so this idea of, of corruption and centering around water doesn't sound all that exciting, but it is when you get to, So they did a lot of research into the, the water frauds and what a movie around that could, could look like. But why is the movie called Chinatown? I'm going to read you a passage that I think is interesting. Um, because, in fact, this movie, everybody kept asking, is this movie filmed in Chinatown? No. The only thing that happens in Chinatown is right at the very end, the climactic scene at the end. Um, but uh, Town had this conversation with a vice cop who worked there. Where do you work, he asked the vice cop. Right now we're working in Chinatown. What do you do there? Nothing. What do you mean nothing? Well, that's pretty much what we're told to do in Chinatown, is nothing. Because with the different tongs, those are Chinese gangs, with the different tongs, the language, and everything else, we can't tell whether we're helping somebody commit a crime or helping to prevent one. So we just, we do nothing. And, and that's, that's the real meaning of the title, Chinatown. Uh, you're going to be placed in a 1930s uh, amoral, confusing, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, uh, what do you do uh, kind of atmosphere. And, and uh, um, it, it's very much anti-Philip Marlowe. You know, uh, Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe was of that era, but Philip Marlowe, as cynical and hard-boiled as he was, he knew what was happening. What Town wanted to write was a, a, a movie where the detective thinks he knows what's happening, but he really doesn't know what's happening. The, the layers get rolled off, and all of a sudden what he thought was this is that, and what that is this, and all of a sudden he discovers there's a subtext and things happening underneath, and that it's a lot more complex than he ever thought it would be. Um, before we, before we get into the movie plot, I, I want to tell you a story that I had probably, this was probably eight years ago, nine years ago. Um, I like to buy movie uh, screen-worn memorabilia. Uh, and, and, you know, often it'll cost $1,000, $1,500, uh, sometimes $2,500 if you, $3,000 if you want, you know, Steve McQueen's sailor pants off of the sand pebbles. I bid on those. I, I, I decided I didn't want them that bad. But... Um, about eight or nine years ago, up comes the detective's screen-worn suit, the one that Jack Nicholson wore when he played J.J. Giddis, Jake Giddis, the detective. Kind of a gray suit. And so I thought, well, you know, I'll pay $2,500 for this thing. I, and I started the bidding, and I got up to twenty five, dollars and it crept beyond that. And I thought, well, I don't guess I want it that badly. Uh, before it was over, uh, that suit sold for, with the buyer's premium, sold for approximately $50,000. And my first thought, and I'll never know the answer, was it Jack Nicholson that wanted that suit so badly? 
But the movie is so iconic uh, that maybe it's some collector someplace who had $50,000 in their hands. But, uh, but it's an iconic movie. It's often now rated amongst the top 10 movies ever made. And so the Chinatown movie is a significant movie. Uh, and, as, and as the author of this book wants to point out, one of the last of its kind in so many ways. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, uh, some fun parts of this book. Uh, so he knows he has a story and he wants it to be about water corruption, cor uh, taking water from elsewhere and bringing it into L.A. Uh, L.A.'s always had a water problem. Uh, so he knows he wants to do that. He, he, wants, he knows he wants an anti-Philip Marlowe and J.J. Giddis, who is fooled, confused, thinks he knows but doesn't know. Uh, he knows he wants to uh, do all these things but how do you get your screenplay written? Fun part of this book is he writes about all the script. The script ballooned to almost 400 pages at one point. All the different script changes, and he throws them out. You know, uh, this one does that, this one does that. And you go, no, that's not Chinatown. That's just an initial script. And it was a big, bloated script. Uh, with all kinds of characters and, and wandering all around, generally about water stuff, but, uh, but a lot of characters, and Town didn't know how to end it either. How do you end this story? Uh, well, um, one of the great details of this book tells us something most people didn't know. Robert Town had a friend named Edward Taylor uh, who did a whole lot of writing with him, never would take credit, but was a major uh, factor in Town's writing. And Edward Taylor never wanted credit. He was always in the background. But we see a lot of Edward Taylor as they try to figure out what's this movie really about besides amoral corruption and, and, and a detective who's fooled and has to try to figure out what reality is, and it centers around water. So you have this, this business about uh, how do you end it. Let's talk about the movie a, a little bit. Um, just if Most of you have seen it, but if you have not, Basically, Chinatown starts with Detective J.J. Giddis does a lot of divorce work, and in walks a woman who thinks her husband, uh, Hollis Mulray, is cheating on her uh, and wants Giddis to take pictures of the assignations with the other woman. Uh, well, we will find out later that this woman is an actress. She is not Hollis Mulray's wife. Um, and. We don't need to get too deep into this, but already he thinks he knows what he really doesn't know. Uh, it turns out Hollis Mulray ends up dead, as does this actress who was playing his wife at somebody else's behest. Hollis Mulray happens to be the head of the water department in Los Angeles. Uh, they find his body down by a reservoir, and it looks like he's been murdered or drowned. Uh, uh, his body it shows obvious drowning. Uh, he's been drowned by somebody, or maybe he drowned on his own. Who knows? But his body is found there at the reservoir, and uh, then to go talk to his widow, uh, Giddis finds out she's not really his widow, and by the way, she's dead on the floor. Um, so uh, then, then he's got to keep going. He he found Mulray with this blonde woman at one point. He had pictures of it all. It turns out the blonde woman is Hollis Mulray's real wife, Evelyn Mulray. Uh, so Evelyn, it turns out, is the daughter, and you, all, you find this stuff out bit by bit through this movie. Evelyn is the daughter of uh, Noah Cross, who is a big land developer, mover and shaker in early L.A., who was actually a, worked closely on water issues with Hollis Mulray. And his daughter married Hollis Mulray. Noah Cross is in so many ways the villain of this piece. But J.J. Giddis, Giddis cannot figure out what part Noah Cross plays in this. Was Hollis Mulray murdered? Um, so he, when he finds out that Hollis's widow is actually Evelyn Mulray, the daughter of of Noah Cross, um, he begins pushing and pushing and pushing to find out what the real story is. Uh, 
he, he, goes, he goes to nursing homes in other parts of California to find people who sign documents. He goes to public records in other places and finds out that, guess what, there was a giant water scandal by these people associated with the water interests in L.A. to, to siphon off those water resources of these other parts of California. You go into, you go into uh, orchards in other parts of California and, and, uh, and people try to, try to throw you out. You go to the nursing home and they run you off. There are nefarious, uh, there are nefarious things afoot, but Jake Giddis has a hard time figuring out what those are exactly. What's happening here? Um, I'm not, I, I don't want to, I'm just going to do a spoiler because the movie's worth seeing just for the movie's sake. Uh, but it turns out uh, that Hollis Mulray was murdered. He was drowned in Noah Cross's koi pond in the backyard because later in the movie we find his glasses that nobody could find on him at the reservoir are at the bottom of the koi pond. So he was drowned in the koi pond, he was taken to the reservoir, and it made, to make it look like maybe, maybe he committed suicide or somebody killed him at the reservoir. Um, and then we find out as J.J. J. J. Giddes gets closer to the widow, across his daughter, Evelyn Mulray, that she has a child, but the child is not the child of Hollis Mulray. Whose child is it? And, and this adds a whole nother layer, something that hadn't really been done in Hollywood before. Um, she, turns out her daughter, and you only find this out towards the end, her daughter is the daughter of her self and her father, a child of incest. And she's trying to protect her daughter from her father's corruption her father was the one making money off these transactions. That's why he killed Hollis Mulray. Uh, that's, uh, he, he, had, he had raped his own daughter, conceived a child, um, and she wanted, to get, she wanted to get that child away from her father. Uh, and, and in the end, uh, Giddes finds out all of this, and there's a climactic scene at the very end where she's trying to get her daughter away. She's in a car. They're finally in Chinatown. And Noah Cross comes up and, and she just has to leave, but the police are looking for her. And as she drives away, way down the street, uh, she is actually shot by the police fleeing the scene and she's killed. And that's the last fade to crane shot. That's the last scene from uh, Chinatown. So the, the, the denouement in the end does come in Chinatown. Now, one of the rich pieces of this movie is, uh, um, is, the, is the photography. Uh, like, like a lot of movies, um, there's a certain amount of accident and magic that goes into what happens. This movie, they changed scores. They changed cinematographers uh, from, from uh, Stanley Cruz to John Alonso. Uh, and, and these are all perfect substitutions. Um, but... A lot of the, interestingly, a lot of the script stuff came from the personal experiences of, of the people involved in writing the script and the director. Uh, the script was from Robert Town, but when, when Roman Polanski, fresh from, um, fresh from Rosemary's Baby, came in to direct this, a Polish guy, what's he directing a movie about old Los Angeles? Well, he was, he was a technician, a man of, of incredible uh, uh, thoroughness. Uh, and, and so basically he comes in and, and the script is pared down uh, and he gives it an ending that is uh, much more murky. It really is an ending deserving of the name Chinatown. Um, I, I want to read uh, several things from personal experience in this movie. Um, a backstory you need to know on Roman Polanski. Um, Roman Polanski came to live in Southern California with his girlfriend Sharon Tate. And as you may remember, I remember I was consumed by it for two weeks. I watched all the, the news coverages. Uh, she and her friends, Wojciech uh, Furkowski and Abigail Folger and Jay Sebring were in her house on Cielo Drive. 
in L.A. And they were murdered, viciously murdered, helter-skelter. They were murdered by the Manson family group. Roman Polanski had kept saying he was going to come back from Europe and, and see Sharon Tate, but before he could quite get back, she is murdered. So this fellow who is already scarred by the Holocaust, by losing his mother, uh, by running for his own life from the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, now has his treasured, beautiful movie actress wife murdered on Cielo Drive. Um, needless to say, it changed his life. He spent his time trying to figure out if some of his friends had done it, who might have done it. And they found a pair of eyeglasses uh, that, were, that was an interesting uh, find that, that might uh, he discovered the eyeglasses. So it's probably not an accident that the eyeglasses of Hollis Mulray in the Koi Pond uh, come out of his own experience. Uh, and um, interestingly, uh, the, the, uh, you'll find a scene in this movie when J.J. Giddis finds out that this child is the child of Evelyn and her father, uh, and there's this father-sister, father-sister uh, dialogue. That comes, that comes from personal experience also. You may remember the, uh, the actress uh, dancer more than anything else, uh, Barry Chase. Um, Barry was uh, the daughter uh, of Borden Chase, the screenwriter. Um, she danced with Fred Astaire. She was one of his dance partners, Barry Chase. You, you see her in movies in the 50s into the 60s. But Barry Chase uh, and Jack Nicholson and Town and all those people uh, often met each other as part of uh, Jeff Corey's acting class in L.A. You'll remember Jeff Corey. You'd know him if you see him, a character actor from the 40s. Uh, he had an acting class that was kind of a la uh, later Lee Strasberg kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of these young actors took Jeff Corey's classes. These folks met in Jeff Corey's classes, but Barry Chase, um, Town, and e Eddie Taylor, his ghost writer, were in a converted garage going over the details of, of, of the Borden Chase scandal in 1957. So this is uh, 15 years before, 16 years before. Uh, but, but this conversation was remembered. Borden Chase, the screenwriter, actually had an affair with his own stepdaughter. A, a child was conceived and, and Barry Chase, Town, Eddie Taylor were in that garage and, and Barry Chase says, Eddie and Robert wouldn't let it go, confused and fascinated. They had her explain over and over the relationship and the sequence of events between Borden Chase, his wife, his step but adopted daughter, uh, She was your stepsister? My half-sister. Your mother's daughter? Yes, but I always referred to her as my sister. How old was she when 24? And how old were you, 16? How did she find them, your mother, detectives, arrayed on her own daughter with her husband? Then she found out my sister was pregnant. That stopped them. Pregnant by your father? And Chase nodded. Would that make you the baby sister or the aunt? Sister Town said, I think. No, Taylor countered, aunt. Sister, aunt, they took off. Sister, aunt, sister, aunt. She's her sister and her aunt. There was maybe something there, but would a woman as coolly withdrawn as Evelyn Mulray just come out and say it? Well, that's the way it happens in the movie, just like the conversations uh, Barry Chase was having with the screenwriter Robert Town. Um, and and that, is, that is what was driving her to try to protect her daughter and to try to flee when she was shot in killed. Um, now, how this film get made in the first place? This sounds so, so bizarre as something that a mainline audience would, would love. Well, it really comes out of the fact that the screenwriter Robert Town, the actor Jack Nicholson, and the, and the studio head Robert Evans were all friends, and, and they could sit down and work these things out and, and uh, um, Evans was not your normal studio head. He had been an actor. He was involved in all, as all aspects of movies. He watched the rushes and commented on them, and so um, he, he was really involved. Um, 
And, and that, it's that friendship that made it go. What really made the movie go was when they brought in uh, Roman Polanski as the director because he cut down a bloated script. He gave it a ver very murky, immoral ending that, and a lot of surprises, and it really does end up in Chinatown uh, with the Chinatown mentality. Uh, but part of, part of the uh, fun of this was also um, uh, the actors. You know, Jack Nicholson is Jack Nicholson. He was Jake Giddis, J.J. Giddis. He, um, he's always Jack Nicholson no matter who he's playing, but he did so well with the detective. Um, they brought in, as Evelyn Mulray, they brought in um, Faye Dunaway. Now, Faye Dunaway was known as a very insecure and difficult actress. A lot of demands, a lot of stuff would happen where Faye Dunaway was in a movie. And Roman Polanski was a detail person. Uh, and, and the screaming matches between them uh, are legendary. Uh, but Robert Evans, with his personality, was able to bring them back together again. And so this movie could be made because she was a great Evelyn Mulray uh, and, and uh, brought in, interestingly, to play her father, Noah Cross, was the great director, sometime actor, John Huston. You know, John's father, Walter, was a famous actor of his era. John had made many movies, uh, really an interesting personality, and every once in a while he acted. Uh, he wanted this role of, of the very um, avuncular but really evil Noah Cross. Uh, and he liked Jack Nicholson. Uh, he and Jack were friends. Uh, as a backstory, Jack lived with his daughter Angelica Houston. And they, in fact, one of the funny s scenes was uh, where, where uh, double entendre kind of stuff is used is when, is when um, Jack Nicholson and Angelica and some other people uh, were sitting together with John Houston and John Houston said, well, I understand you're sleeping with my daughter. They said uh, the, the the redness in the face of Angelica Houston was instant, uh, but then he said, Mr. Giddis, <laughs> and so he was, he was talking about his movie daughter, Evan Mulray, uh, and J.J. Giddis, who did uh, have an affair, um, uh, but, but he, he kind of used that double edge. That was his sense of humor. Jack Nicholson loved him. He really thought a lot of Jack Nicholson. Uh, they were very close. Um, even, even past his uh, separation from, uh, uh, from Houston's daughter, uh, Angelica, that came later. Um, now, I particularly want to uh, want to read a passage that will tell you what kind of technician and perfectionist Roman Polanski was. All the scenes in this movie are well thought out. Um, let me read a scene in which um, he's in the orchard doing his investigation and the, the guy in the orchard knocks Jake Giddis down. He's on the ground. They would now go in for Jack's close-up. A shot of him knocked out in the dirt. Polanski, the camera hovering over his shoulder, leaned over Nicholson's face. Don't look, he said. Close your eyes. Studying the result, Jake's head haloed in bits of bark and leaves. Polanski cleared the brush from around Jack and re-examined the picture. Jake's head framed against the empty brown dirt and reconsidered yet again. Pol Polanski selected a green walnut off the ground, placed it beside, but not too close to, his actor's head. He then added a brown walnut to the composition. He moved the green walnut two or three inches to the side and Jack opened his close your eyes. He moved the walnut back. He then let an ant crawl onto his finger and he lowered it onto Jack's face. Roll camera, please. Polanski backed out of the frame. Jack, eyes closed. The ant crawled over Jack's nose, along the bridge, up to the forehead. Polanski to the operator, did you get it? Didn't get it. We'll do it again. Polanski crouched beside Jack, scouring the dirt for another ant. Eyes closed. <laughs> Jesus, Jack chuckled. Roman found his aunt, edged it into Nicholson's face. Roll camera, he said, backing out. Rolling. From out of frame, Polanski watched the ant seem to climb up Nicholson's cheek, change its mind, 
climbed down off his face, cut. Polanski ducked back into the frame to adjust the ant. So, Jack Drawl, let me get this straight. Eyes closed. When the ant gets it right, we've got to take. That's correct. Jack smiled too big. How long are you going to hold on this shot, Roman? A second, maybe two. Roll camera, please. Polanski stepped out and all eyes were on the insect, the costliest ant in human history. It went on for 40 minutes. Then Polanski, satisfied, thanked the crew. He had gotten what he wanted. Now, if that's, um, if that's not perfectionism, what is? Um, now, I've already told you the end of the story. You know the denouement. Uh, but once they had the film wrapped, they previewed it locally, and crowds hated the modern score that was with the film. Uh, they affirmatively hated it. So Robert Evans had to go quickly to Jerry Goldsmith, a famous uh, musical uh, uh, composer, and, and you've seen his, uh, you've seen him on many movies. But Goldsmith um, jumped in at the last minute, wrote a score that is haunting and fabulous. It's, it's a uh, interesting part of Chinatown. This was last minute after they had already previewed the film. They changed the whole score. Uh, and then, of course, the final great scene in Chinatown. Uh, so what kind, of, what kind of reception is a movie like this going to get? Uh, well, it turns out it was a critical success. It was a popular success. Uh, Robert Town won an Oscar for Best Screenwriter. It was, it was nominated for 11 Oscars. It did not win uh, any but that one because it was head to head with uh, Godfather 2, which uh, some rate among the best five movies in the history of the movies. And, and so uh, they're both usually in the top 10. And so uh, Godfather 2 ran off with the Oscars, but uh, Town got his Oscar for best screenwriter. And I guess in some senses, Edward Taylor, his ghost writing friend, um, Knew, knew how much he had contributed. So postscript, Jack Nicholson goes on to make um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and he gets an Academy Award as Best Actor for Cuckoo's Nest. Um, the uh, Evans, interestingly, not long after this, when he's kind of resurrected Paramount and done so much to bring Paramount's reputation for good movies back, is replaced as head of the studio by Barry Diller, who, who was coming from TV. They thought they needed TV at this point. Barry Diller came from uh, ABC to head that studio, and uh, Town descended into a lot of drug abuse. He's still around, and, and he still continued to do a lot of script doctor work on a lot of movies. Uh, Polanski is probably the most difficult of these, of these uh, people his, his life after, because as you remember, um, he was arrested and was getting ready to be tried um, sometime after this for basically uh, raping a 13-year-old girl. He liked young girls. He always did. It was a personality thing for him. Uh, he tried to make peace and they tried to work it out various ways, but the fact is, before it was over with, Roman Polanski left the United States, has never come back. Uh, the charge for the uh, violation with the 13-year-old is still there. He will never be able to come back to the United States, and, and uh, he, he continued afterwards to make brilliant movie after brilliant movie from Europe and elsewhere. but. Uh, never could come back to Los Angeles. Um, well, they tried to make another a sequel. It's called The Two Jakes. Uh, it ended up being a Town Evans um, uh, Nicholson enterprise. Town wasn't up to the script anymore. This was going to be set in 1948, 10 years later. It would be Jake Giddis and uh, it would be Two Jakes and uh, Harvey Keitel was, was hired to do the other Jake. 
but it just kind of disintegrated. Town's inability to get the screenplay out. Uh, Robert Evans' uh, problems uh, caused him to have to withdraw from it. And Jack Nicholson was left doing the movie pretty much himself as director, as actor, and, and uh, uh, trying to deal with the, the getting the screenplay knocked into shape when Town couldn't do it. Um, it's an interesting movie, but it is not up to the standards of Chinatown. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's more, it's, it's town writing without Roman Polanski directing and being able to, to, to basically make things more concise and direct. And so Two Jakes uh, was kind of moderately reviewed and uh, Nicholson said, w there will not be a third one, and there never has been. That was in 1990 when Two Jakes came out. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, that's the story of Chinatown, but we need to uh, just look back at this and see how much, um, how much was by accident, how much was by genius, uh, what takes a, a regular film to a great film it can often be a series of accidents and, and with people of genius, uh, things just happen sometimes. The big bloated script is taken down to, by Roman Polanski, not town, down to a script that is concise and, and, and makes sense. Uh, of course, it has a very murky, immoral tone to it. The ending certainly does. Uh, but as everybody said, you know, his late wife, Sharon Tate, who was murdered, was a blonde. Everybody says uh, w the minute he took the helm of this movie, uh, the, the blonde uh, star was going to be murdered. You just knew it was going to happen. Uh, he, he was very cynical uh, after her violent death. He was very cynical after what he had experienced in the Warsaw Ghetto. And so you knew it, it was going to be a pretty heavy piece. But it, it was loved. The music that came together even afterwards, uh, when they didn't like the original, uh, original music, the, the dialogue, um, there's some really great dialogue in this movie. Billy Wilder told Robert Evans, the, the studio, he said, you know, there's some issues with the script here, but you know, one good line can make up for a lot of things in the script. And there were some really good lines in, in Chinatown. Uh, and the casting. You know, Jack Nicholson is a great J.J. Giddis. It turns out, for all her difficulty, Faye Dunaway was a fabulous Evelyn Mulray. And it also turns out that, that uh, uh, John Huston, as Noah Cross, was brilliant casting. Now, need to mention that he was drunk when they filmed the last scenes of Chinatown. But he did a wonderful drunken job of it, and, and uh, is, is just fabulous. And so uh, he was always an interesting actor, but mainly a director. So casting, dialogue, music, script, it all comes together, and some of it's accident and some of it's genius. Uh, but all I would say at this point is in movie making, sometimes you make a movie and it's just magic. And that's what happened with Chinatown. And that's why it's one of the best movies ever made. So with this background, hopefully you will enjoy Chinatown more uh, when you get a chance to watch it again. Thanks.